Are continuous glucose monitors, or CGMs, useful for non-diabetics? How do they work? What's it like to use one? And what can you learn about your body by using one? Here's everything you need to know about CGMs. CGMs were designed for diabetics as a way to continuously monitor their blood sugar in real time. So it's a small device, usually placed on your abdomen or on your arm, and it has a tiny filament that goes through your skin and samples your interstitial fluid. Now, interstitial fluid is the fluid that leaks from your capillaries and bathes all the cells in your body. Since CGMs first came out in the late 90s, physicians would prescribe them to diabetic patients. But as we focus more on health optimization and preventive medicine, many non-diabetics are finding them useful too. Some are pushing back, saying that non-diabetics using CGMs, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, and there's little evidence for their use in those who have a normal glucose response. I don't really agree, and here's why. First, how can you know whether or not someone has a normal glucose response unless you first track it? We generally use fasting glucose or hemoglobin A1C to assess whether or not someone is pre-diabetic or diabetic, but this is still a very incomplete picture. Just because someone's fasting blood sugar or A1C are considered within the normal range, that doesn't rule out the possibility of high glucose variability, whereby their sugar goes up and down in large swings. In other words, A1Cs are not reliably accurate in predicting someone's true average blood sugar, and a fasting morning blood sugar level can vary significantly based on other factors beyond their metabolic health. Things like sleep quality, stress levels, last night's dinner, and so on. A 2018 study found severe glucose variability among a quarter of the 60 non-diabetic participants, with glucose levels reaching pre-diabetic ranges, defined as values greater than 140 mg per deciliter. We're starting to see that metabolic dysfunction is far more common amongst the average American than we initially thought. You may argue, so what? After all, a 2019 study that attempted to create reference ranges for glycemic profiles among non-diabetics found that they spent 96% of the time between 70 and 140 mg per deciliter, and that this is what we should consider normal. The problem is that higher glucose variability and higher and more frequent spikes are both associated with accelerated onset of disease and death, even in non-diabetics. We're talking about things like increased rates of cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, cancer death, cardiovascular death, and death from any cause. So let's say, like most of us, you don't eat the healthiest diet and you maybe partake in the occasional or even the frequent consumption of processed foods that spike your blood sugar. As that blood sugar rises, your pancreas secretes insulin and that helps that sugar get taken up by the cells of the body. Now, repeatedly high levels over time can lead to insulin resistance, which can lead to metabolic syndrome and then full-blown diabetes. When insulin resistance happens, less sugar is taken up by the cells, so your circulating blood sugar rises. That blocks fat from your adipose cells from being broken down as fuel and being used for energy. There are other problems too, like inflammation, oxidative stress, and others. And we know that the majority of chronic illnesses are rooted in metabolic dysfunction, things like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, stroke, and many others. All right, so as humans, we're often pretty terrible at assessing the importance of behaviors for long-term benefit, so here are some of the short-term benefits that you have to look forward to. The first is behavior change. First, CGMs have a tight feedback loop, meaning that you can see the effect of your behaviors almost instantly. In short, this means they are very powerful accountability tools to change behavior, while also serving as analytical tools to personalize strategies based on your unique physiology. Second is improved mental performance. If you care about productivity, know that you can at least partially blame your food comas, also known as postprandial somnolence, to poor blood sugar control. Your brain is actually very sensitive to these glucose swings. Even though the brain is only roughly 2% of your body weight, it burns approximately 25% of your calories. And when you're studying hard or doing something else that's really cognitively demanding, it uses even more energy. So what does good blood sugar management look like? Good metabolic fitness looks like this. Minimal blood sugar rises after meals, rapid return to baseline levels after meals, overall a narrow long-term range of blood sugar levels, meaning you don't go too high or too low at any point of the day, and fasting blood sugar levels in a healthy and low risk range. Poor metabolic function looks like this. High blood sugar spikes after meals, prolonged elevated levels after meals, high fasting blood sugar levels in the morning, and higher variability day to day. We used to think that the glycemic index of any food was adequate at telling you which foods would cause a favorable versus unfavorable response. The problem is everyone has their own unique gut microbiome and genetic composition, and that makes each of our metabolisms different. So a food that spikes me may not spike you, and vice versa, and this is why the glycemic index isn't actually all that reliable. If you've learned anything in this video so far, let us know what has stuck out to you most with a comment down below. I purchased my first CGM through Levels back in 2020, and after that first month, I was sold. 
and I love their approach to metabolic fitness and overall wellness. I reached out to them afterward to see if we could work together, and they've been supporting us ever since. Since then, I've been actually wearing a CGM almost every single day, and here's what I've learned. First is that post-meal walks are surprisingly helpful. Every Thanksgiving at my cousin's house, we'd go for a walk after dinner. And when I was younger, I used to think this is just some boomer behavior, but as I got older, I realized that I felt better when I went for that post-meal walk. It turns out that even this low-level exercise of walking can do wonders to blunt spikes. There isn't a magic duration, and I've actually found that it largely depends on the meal composition, how much you ate, things like that, but even 15 minutes is gonna show significant benefits. I try to aim for closer to 30 minutes whenever possible. Second is that the order of eating matters. At most restaurants, your salad comes out before your main entree, and that's a good thing. If you have two identical meals, and they both contain the same protein, same vegetables, same carbohydrates, then you can actually have very different blood sugar responses depending on how you eat that meal. By eating high fiber foods first, things like vegetables, you're consuming fiber and front loading the gut lumen with that fibrous material. That means that when you eat your carbohydrates, their digestion is slowed down and you don't spike nearly as badly. This is another reason why you should have sweets after dinner and not before. Dinner is slowing down the digestion of those sweets, so overall the insult is curbed. This brings me to the third point, which is meal composition. Eating a bowl of rice by itself, which is mostly just carbs, is gonna result in a worse glucose spike compared to eating that rice with other macronutrients. In other words, if you combine those carbohydrates with a source of fat and protein, your blood sugar isn't gonna spike nearly as high. This is generally why fruit smoothies are gonna be better for you than fruit juice. Fruit juice, sugar and water, big spike. Fruit smoothie, you have things like fiber to slow down digestion, but also we generally add things to our smoothies like proteins and fats to give us a more balanced macronutrient profile. Number four is eating later complicates things. If you take the same exact meal and you have it at 6 p.m. versus 10 p.m., you're gonna have two very different effects on your blood sugar and your sleep. The reason being is that melatonin, the sleep hormone that's secreted by the pineal gland, rises at night. It also inhibits insulin secretion by binding to receptors on the pancreas. So what's interesting is that by eating this meal later at night, you're gonna spike harder, and having this wild variation, this hyperglycemia, reactive hypoglycemia, being all over the place as you sleep, results in much worse sleep quality. And I've actually verified this with my aura ring. My aura ring tracks things like my resting heart rate, my HRV, my sleep stages, at least approximately. And overall, my sleep quality is much worse if I don't have a nice, steady, even glucose response. Speaking of sleep, it's not just having poor blood sugar control at night that's gonna cause bad sleep, but bad sleep can also cause poor blood sugar control. If I'm sleep deprived one night, my glucose variability is through the roof the whole next day. I've also found that drinking a few drinks the night before can also wreck my sleep quality, which also compromises my glucose control the entire next day. So not surprisingly, ever since wearing one of these, I've decreased my alcohol intake substantially. Number six is earn the cheat. This was by far my favorite finding. It's natural to occasionally have cravings and cave into your temptations. That's normal, nothing to be ashamed of. But to minimize the damage, I found that by doing intense exercise, either before or after the meal, I could largely flatten my glycemic response. And the more intense the exercise, Size, the more I could cheat and actually get away with it. I noticed intense cardio is more effective for this purpose than intense strength training. Now my go-to is cycling and a single hard 90 minute session has worked wonders for me. And finally, as I mentioned in my five bad habits I learned from medical school video, I tend to eat really fast, which is largely a bad habit from my medical school and plastic surgery days. When you have to rush to the operating room and you're backed up with patient care responsibilities, you're forced to scarf down food as quickly as possible. The issue is that this is going to spike your blood sugar much more compared to slowing down, enjoying your food, and eating like a normal human being. Look, I'm a huge fan of what Levels is doing, not only bringing the benefits of CGMs to the masses, but also constantly improving their product. They have frequent updates to their very slick app, so you don't even have to be a doctor to interpret the results. Big thanks to Level for sponsoring this video and for supporting this channel for so long. If you wanna try a CGM for yourself, then visit the link in the description to get two months free with your membership. I think you're gonna find it incredibly helpful. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, then check out this one or that one. Much love, my friends, and I'll see you guys there.